you are now leading this extraordinarily big company. How do you think of yourself as a leader now? How do you? How did you think about your role on the inspiration side as a this leader? This is a really important time. How do you deal with that? Welcome to No Turning Back, a podcast hosted by General Stan McChrystal and myself, Chris Fussell. Our goal here is simple, to have serious conversations with serious leaders so that we can learn from the best and navigate these complex times together. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to this episode of No Turning Back. This week, Stan and I welcome Scott Reckler to the podcast. Scott is the CEO of RxR Realty in New York City and one of the largest owners and developers of commercial real estate in NYC. In this episode, Stan and I talk about the future of work, what that will look like uh, on the backside of this pandemic from a, an expert who knows the ins and outs of the physical workspace, office uh, specifics, better than anyone I know in the field. For example, will our children still go into physical schools? Will in the future they enter offices that look anything like what we know today? What, what are the technologies that are gonna drive the change? Uh, Scott's heavily involved with projects across that front, as well as uh, at a higher scale. Will people still want to live in cities? What are the changes that are going to uh, take place there over the years to come as a result of the past uh, 12 months or so? And most importantly, what does all of that mean for today's leader? Uh, Scott sits at this fascinating intersection of public and private. Uh, as I mentioned, he runs a, a very large and important real estate company, but he also sat on the board of director directors uh, of the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, the MTA. He was a vice chair of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, and he's seen how large multi-decade investment decisions get made in the public space. Uh, there's nobody better positioned to talk about what the physical future of work will look like than our friend Scott. Uh, we hope you enjoy the episode. Well, Scott, let's, let's let it rip. Let's do it. All right. You're one of the recognized experts on where people live and work. You know, as one of the central real estate owners and operators in New York City, you have insights that most of us aren't going to have on what the trends are, what they've been in the past, where things are going. And over the next 30 minutes, we're going to get an opportunity to sort of look at near term, mid term and, and long term. And then some personal things about how you do that. But let's start at the far ridge line. I've got three granddaughters. One is six, one is almost four, and one is one. Take me out 40 years in the future and tell me how Emmylou, Elsie, and Daisy are going to live. Where will they live? Where will they work? Where will they shop? How will their life be in the world 40 years in the future? Uh, 40 years. That's a long, a long time now, especially, you know, as we've lived through this, this COVID experience, it feels like the last 10 months we've had, you know, 10 years worth of an acceleration of what normally would evolve. Um, but I, I think that does set the foundation of how your grandkids uh, will live, which is that I think they're going to live in a, uh, a place where the mixture of live and work and, and community are going to be much more merged uh, as one. And, uh, you know, we began to see a trend already uh, with the younger generation of, of workers that they viewed um, work not being a nine to five exercise, but really a five to nine exercise. And the the workplace and, and where they lived, there was a merger of home and work life. And the, the people uh, that they work with became their support groups. They becomes their, their, their peers, the people that they can share uh, experience or turn to for a, a advice um, and, and mentorship and where they met their, you know, their new friends or significant others that build their life. And so I think that that merger uh, is going to become more and more uh, apparent as, as, as technology takes hold. And I think that the connectivity, the connective tissue, though, isn't going to just be about the physical space. It's also going to be about the digital interactions and the, the, the hybrid approach of what the physical and digital, what we call digital relationships um, and how, you know, whether that's how they shop, how they communicate, working remotely from home or working within an office, um, living in environments that they can maybe be geographically a little bit further apart um, for a quality of life, but come together as a, as a community, um, right? And I think that we learned through this past experience, you know, how do you socially distance 
but stay spiritually attached at a time of crisis. And um, I think that 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 learning uh, and the, the generation that's going to come that live through this and the generation that will have, uh, you know, in their younger years, have their lives informed by this are, are going to be taken to that uh, as we as we go forward uh, in the future. And then when they do do things physically, it is going to be a lot more about experience. You know, they're not going to if they can shop, they shop online, they will shop online. But if they want to go for an outing to be with their friends, it's going to be about that experience, about that connection. The same thing is going to be about the workplace. If they can work productively from home to enhance their quality of life, to reduce their commute, to, to support their family, they will, unless when they go to the workplace, they're engaged, um, they're, they're, they have you know a series of culture building, mentorship. So their whole work environment is going to be one where it's going to be much more curated uh, about, uh, about engagement as well. So, um, Scott, to, to build on that a little bit, um, Stan, I just, as students of history, as I know you are, it's always interesting to, to look at the things that you take for granted or I act this way. And there's, there's uh, examples and countless examples of this in the military. Um, a small example, when I was in, a young officer in Iraq, I was on a um, MH-53 helicopter that apparently the, the, the um, it was in its last tour and it had flown in the Sante raid in Vietnam. And, and the, the craft had just pent. Oh, we didn't know that when you were on it. <laughs> well, he told us that right before he took off and nobody was too excited about it. Uh, but, you know, we, we assumed like this, this is our generation and, and we were living into something that planners had decided, here's what aircraft will need to look like. And then, you know, decades later, um, we're sort of living in, into that reality that they had thought about. So, when you look at it through that lens, um, sort of a two-part question here. How much of a reset do you think this year will be to changing the way those long-term dollars are being invested in the, in the, and the plans are being laid? I mean, in your world, you could take the Brooklyn Bridge as an example, right? The, the impact that had on physically connecting people between places that had been separated was a very thoughtful thing that, you know, now cent decades later, we're all, we're all living the results of yeah. that. What reset do you think we're in right now? And where do you think those dollars and planners should be thinking about on that 40, 50 year horizon? Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting because the the amount of innovation and that have, has actually happened um, in response to COVID, both in, in, in science and technology in terms of having to you know deal with public health issues as well as address the way we have to live and work differently. Um, that's all going to be felt on the other side of this. And we haven't even really begun to see the amount of, um, of, of experiences that are going to come. So going back to Stan's question, you know, I think people are going to be investing much more in, in virtual reality, um, you know, having almost like, a, like avatars in your office. But, you know, one, it was as, as people have this mix of hybrid working from home and working from work and, and, and working at work, the challenge is how do you bring community together? How do you have an engagement and that, and that physical relationship. So I think you're gonna see uh, some of that uh, that hasn't happened. I think the recognition of uh, the need for broadband um, availability and distribution uh, more broadly uh, to ensure equality of, uh, of, of access and education uh, and frankly, healthcare is gonna be an area. I think healthcare in general uh, is gonna, this has been a moment in time uh, where you know you can think about healthcare. This will be a demarcation line of how healthcare used to be operate versus how it will operate in the future in terms of a more distributed model, uh, where people use telehealth and virtual healthcare. And I can imagine in our office buildings and our uh, residential communities having wellness centers with clinicians that connect virtually to physicians. And that's where you go when you don't feel well, when you want to check up, when you need a prescription it all happens seamlessly and it just becomes health and wellness becomes a much more uh, daily part of our routine than a need to have to go to a doctor's office or to an urgent care or to a um, an emergency room if, you, if you're not feeling well. And so I think a lot of these things are going to change. Um, and there's, you know, and I would say that there's, there's coming out of this mega trends that the, if you focus on where those mega trends are, that's where the dollars are going, right? So e-commerce we spoke about. So anything related to e-commerce, anything related to digital infrastructure is gonna be another mega trend where people are gonna be focusing on how do you invest dollars to help build out that infrastructure. 
Again, healthcare, I think, is going to be another one where people are going to be uh, focusing on. And then the, the last piece of that is how do you um, adapt all of the old infrastructure and, and product um, and, you know, and structures that was for a, a century that was from the past so that actually can be competitive in the future? So how many malls can be converted to logistics uh, centers or 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 data centers, or how our office buildings can be adjusted for uh, different forms of housing or, or modernized for the 21st century to create that live work environment that I described, or hotels created for affordable housing, right? So that uh, I think the imagination now is not only where are we investing in new, but how do we deal with all the legacy uh, assets like that helicopter? Uh, is anything salvageable on it or not salvageable, right? It, that's fascinating, Scott. Chris and I grew up in a, uh, a lifestyle where security of information was everything. So to get in our compounds, you had to have special permission. To get in the buildings in the compound, you had special permission. To make your computer operate, you had to have a special card. I mean, all these layers of security. And when you talked about public health, it strikes to me that as we congregate in cities, we are going to have to have public health that is almost transparent to us. It's convenient, but it's effective. I know you've done some work with Microsoft uh, recently to try to decide what the workplace would feel like for an employee in the, the backside of this pandemic, but then potentially in preparation for later threats. Can you describe a little bit of that? What will it be different than what we had two years ago? Sure. And, you know, a good analogy, we start with is 9-11, right? When 9-11 happened, um, you know, we had this new threat of terrorism that we all had to coexist with. It was something we never really experienced on our homeland on a day to day basis before or on airplanes or in our tall buildings or public spaces. And we put an infrastructure in place uh, to deal with that. And that infrastructure, whether that was the, in our buildings, putting the turnstiles and metal detectors or uh, the airports having TSA or the Homeland Security Joint Chief uh, Terrorist Task Force that gave us a degree of comfort that we can move forward in the in the as things began to subside some of that infrastructure shed away but a lot of that infrastructure stayed because we were now aware of this new threat and we also realized that the risk reward uh, you know the, of, of, of having that infrastructure in place made us more comfortable and was worth it and I think the same is going to be for health and wellness is that there's going to be a much higher level of a focus on public health safety and you know if it's not COVID-19 is it COVID-25 could be around the corner how do we change our behavior uh, in ways that are relatively seamless so that we can you know live healthily but without having to uh, be and, and feel as abnormal as we've had felt before but um, but learn from those tools and so part of the trick to do that in my opinion uh, is technology how do you integrate um, the, the the digital part of this to complement the physical part, to make life easier relative to transparency. So, you know, measuring the air quality in buildings, um, measuring the, the, the health uh, issues that might be having, happening in neighborhoods and give people the ability to look at a nap in the morning and say, okay, what's the, the quality of, uh, of the health and wellness of a building, right? What's that rating that you might get? So you can make decisions that if you're not necessarily feeling great or you're susceptible to something, you decide to stay uh, at home, how can you use technology to make uh, the, everything touchless so you can walk through your building seamlessly? Um, you know, can you monitor whether there's an elevation of people with the temperatures walking into public places and, and seeing how that, uh, if there is, how would you adjust uh, in that in that regard? Uh, same thing, I think, in terms of the space. You know, I think as you, what we've done on the on the COVID front is we focused a lot of our energy with Microsoft on social distancing face mask compliance technology, using things like computer vision, um, using uh, IOT and where the internet of things, where all of a sudden now our buildings have sensors and data being collected, thousands of pieces of data that we never had before that we're now using uh, to in, to help guide um, our people that work in our buildings to, to do it in a, safe, in a safe way and give them tools where they can see, are they doing it safely? So what's your social distancing score? at the end of the day how you know how long you know what percentage of the day will you buy someone six feet for more than 15 minutes uh you know we all carry around badges uh to your point about being in the military 
that you know basically you know they buzz every time someone's within six feet of each other and they also serve if someone actually needs uh, is actually uh, has the virus we have a track and tracing device that will know everyone that was around so we can then build concentric circles as to how do we go from there you, you'll you, you use this in the future but not for social distancing you'll use this in the future to monitor who is collaborating with who you know how are people using the space and going back to the earlier conversation about the change of, of space and dynamic workplaces we now have invested the infrastructure in our buildings that we're going to be able to give people um you know at the end of a week a report an analysis to say okay who was in your buildings who collaborated um you know who used what amenities who should be working together and not working together so that as we start reimagining the workplace we're able to have the transparency of what's happening and that never happened before you know and you know one i mean i even myself i can't tell you who's in working with who who's in which office at this day right now you're going to have all that visibility and transparency to make good decisions about how do you create a better um, a sense of uh, productivity uh, collaboration innovation uh, going forward and what's working and what's not working and i think ideally you want that that data to be merged and this is what we work in with uh, microsoft on how are people working online and having then the combined analytics between how people are functioning physically how they're operating digitally and how do we optimize that for a a more productive healthy uh, rewarding uh, work environment scott this is fascinating so if i heard you correctly you and microsoft can design a system where all the people that irritate me you can keep them on another floor <laughs> Right, <laughs> and whenever I move around, they they get moved around. That's right. Um, that that would be perfect. I, I'm in. But I want to tell a story and then ask you to to take what you just described a bit further. About 2004 or so in Iraq, we're in a really tough fight, and I had a Delta Force sergeant, very experienced guy, come into my office, and we were talking about operations, and I was sort of asking him, you know. How should we be fighting? And he got in front of a whiteboard and he wrote this, uh, he drew this amazing picture and he drew a compound that we typically would go after Al Qaeda operatives in. Then he drew an unmanned aircraft above. He drew a uh, stick figure people here. He drew some other things and he connected them and he went and connected them with different linkages. And he says, now from this to this, I need video real time. From this to this, I need X. I need these people connected. Boom, boom, boom. He says, sir, that's how we have to fight. And then he looked at me and says, we can't do that because we don't have this stuff connected. You wanna help me, General McChrystal, fix that. And that became sort of our blueprint. We, we kept that picture and we said, okay guys, let's start figuring out, and we did. How do you come up with how people are gonna work You know, without a Delta Sergeant in front of a whiteboard? How do you come up with what right looks like that you then construct? You know, I, I think you hit it. That's a great story because it speaks exactly sort of where we are in the, the built environment, which is that the built environment real estate as an industry has just not digitized itself. And so one of the, the, the faults of that is we don't have the transparency of actually what happens in our buildings, right? You know, this used to be a business that you'd build four walls, sign leases, and then come back at the end to have a conversation. Right now, it's about going to be about activating what happens within those four walls, monitoring what those um, those interactions results are in terms of, of, of progress, and then adjusting. And I think just like you experienced, uh, you know, a shift on the battlefield from you know a command and control back in 2010, you know, we're we're experiencing that now in terms of a shift in how everyone's going to work and I'm, su I'm sure when you began that process i guess it was earlier than that when you began that process it was about learning on the on the go right and i think that's where every company and every ceo and head of real estate that i speak to they're in the process right now of, of trying to figure out okay let me start with the blueprint and then with that blueprint let me now monitor what's working and adjust and does that how much does that mean people should be working remotely how much should be there be more of an agile or hybrid workplace where people come and go at different times? How many people should be working permanently? What type of job descriptions are better equipped? And how do I judge success in all of that? And I think that's gonna be over the next decade, 
um, a process that we're all going to go through that's also going to redefine define urban environments, right? Because if it's different workplaces in different, different ways and public transportation, it's going to have, you know, the, the air travel, it's going to have an impact on so many ways of the past have to be redefined for what that future is. Um, and, and I think, you know, it will be, it's going to be fascinating, but it can't be done without, to your story, the transparency to say, I need to know what's happening there and there. And right now those tools don't exist. Um, and that's what we're building for within our buildings that you can actually see what is happening. That's fascinating. Yeah. It's really interesting. Um, the, just an observation, but um, we say this all the, all the time about the transition that happened in the military over the last 20 years. Um, I joined the service in the late 90s and essentially joined the military that my my father had been in, in the 70s, my grandfather had been in World War II. I mean, this, not, not much had changed structurally in the way it was led. And now it's completely different, at least the parts that I, I served in. So we went through this exponential leap and it just, it seems like c- cities and all these uh, issues of how we work, et cetera. There, our kids will not work in the same environment we, we grew up in. And I, it feels like this is the forcing function, uh, but only time will tell. Can, Scott, can we pivot to um, a leadership discussion here? Because you you know, you know, run your organization uh, in the real estate space, but you also have a, a career of service in the, in the uh, public sector, sitting on boards in, in New York City, Transit Authority and, and, and others. Uh, the 911 Memorial Board. Um, it just it, it deeply invested in in the city and the, and the folks in New York City as well. Um, curious at a, at a high level, how do you see the role of leaders between those two spaces that you sit in? Um, what are the lessons that are transferable across, and where do you see uh, separation between running, uh, you know, a for profit organization and then your your public sector? Yeah, it's a it's a good question, and uh, and it's interesting because I. You know, I think about it a lot and, you know, I'm frequently asked, you know, would you ever want to go into public service as an elected uh, official? And and my response is that I, I think that having one foot in and one foot out uh, is more powerful than having to be um, two feet in. Because when you're an elected official, you have constituents uh, and that tell you how they feel every time they take a poll and then every time they go to the voting booth. And uh, And as you know, to be a leader, Sometimes you have to guide people to where they want to go, and uh, that's gotten harder and harder in in the in this environment. Whether it's the social media, the, you know, some of the divisiveness that's been out there that's made it hard. But as a as a private citizen who's only doing this because I, I care about the good of the our community and the strength of our community, um, it enables me to take positions that otherwise um, would be you know politically challenging. And, and so that, that is an area where, and I think more business people um, have to look at leadership as an obligation. Um, and, you know, Louis Brandeis said the, the most important elected office, most important political office is that of private citizen. And I take that to heart and I try to push that to all the people that I engage with because, you know, if, if we're all committed to making our communities better, um, leaders of, of businesses or civic organizations or whatever groups you're a part of, you know, if we all take that approach, we're going to end up in a, with, a, with a better world. And, um, and I think for a period of time, we as a community have defaulted to everything being um, the fault or the success of our elected leaders, right? And the reality is that's not how the world works, right? The world works is that the people that are elected are elected by us, for us, but also it becomes we have to be by for ourselves. We have to actually make that difference. And uh, and and so being a change agent um, myself and, and trying to in, empower others to be change agents, I think is is uh, is going to be key, particularly in a more distributed way that people operate in in today's world. Whether that's the gig economy or social media, we all have to be aligned uh, in that. And then I'll just end with um, one other point, and I think from the military, you'd appreciate it, right? Because when I think about the military, I think about my experience at like the Port Authority, for example, or at the MTA, where I was vice chair and on the board, and the bureaucracies that existed in both those places, and the challenges of breaking through those bureaucracies, and even embedded in those organizations, you could see, you could find the change makers that knew how to navigate through the bureaucracy, and we're going to get things done. And you could see the people that were just sort of complacent, and they were part of that machinery. 
And and the, the where I always found fascinating though was that whenever there was a crisis, these organizations rose to such a strong level. Everyone rose to this moment in time, right? And I think that they they've been really successful at at, at at getting people engaged in those moments. And part of what I think this is to be successful is you need to be playing an air game and a ground game at all times. And so when I was involved in those bureaucracies, I'd be on those grounds with the people that I knew that maybe weren't from the bureaucratic side empowered to make those decisions, but they were the ones getting the stuff done. But I'd be working the air game of making sure I had the ears of the decision makers and the board to make sure they had cover to get there. And I think that anything you do, whether you're trying to build support from a community, for a project, for whatever that is, you can never neglect that ground game or the air game. You got to be playing both at the same at the same time. Well, wow, Scott, th that was perfect. I'd start by reminding Chris, Scott just correctly said there's air, air force and ground rangers and there's nothing to do with the Navy and SEALs. It's not <laughs> necessary. No. That, that was a really great, almost a civics class you just gave us on the role of the private citizen and the role of leaders. I'm going to pull on leadership just a little further because you talked about organizations rising to the occasion. Chris and I went through selection processes for special operations. And what they essentially do is create a situation that's very difficult to see which leaders emerge and to see how much leadership arises in each person. When COVID appeared, you appeared, you emerged, you were on CNBC, you were on CNN, you were out talking publicly and you were talking internally to your organization. You were communicating I would guess at a rate much faster and much more pervasive than before. I'm going to ask you why, and then I'm going to ask you what you were communicating to the various constituencies. What was the objective? The, the, um, you know, first, I, I want to say that when COVID hit, I, I, I want to thank you because early in that process, uh, I had the opportunity to speak with you and Chris, and you shared some of your experiences about communicating in moments of crisis uh, more broadly, and I adopted some of those tools, uh, particularly internally, which was was really, really um, helpful at a pivotal, pivotal, pivotal moment for us. So, you, you know, I going back through my whole career and again, 9-11 was was somewhat I, I was downtown. I watched the first plane hit the, the buildings. I, I was you know, I lived through that experience of having to react to crisis. And so myself and our organization has been through crises before. And what we've learned in that is you can never under communicate. You just over communicate, over communicate, over communicate. And that those that that, uh, you know, didn't do that, you know, found themselves uh, losing the, the, the trust of their own people and their counterparties and other stakeholders. And no matter how bad it is, as long as you can communicate in a in a, in a thoughtful and, and, and compassionate way, uh, it, it, it makes a difference. This was particularly important because we had to work remotely, right? So we had to bring our whole teams uh, um, away from each other. And, and and there's so much anxiety and uncertainty for so many days in uh, in New York in particular, particularly during the epicenter where we were having this crisis. And so, you know, for me, um, communicating uh, internally on a regular basis uh, was, was something that gave people guidance. I, I adopted one of your, where I had a task force meeting every morning I started with 10 people, ended up having 50 people on it. And it was always, okay, what's the message I got to give to the team? What do I see that's happening right now that I got to give them comfort and confidence to get through this? And then, you know, usually on a Friday, I would try to end with something more as to what I saw coming over the next month. And I'll never forget the end of March um, where I was getting briefings as to what was happening relative to the level of hospitalizations and what that would mean in terms of death rates and talking about I did to my team about the spring is coming, but we're going to have dark days before we have bright days and that we need to brace ourselves for what's about to come and that we're going to get through it, but it's going to be difficult. And we lost ourselves at RxR, six of our team members just in the month of April. And, and I, you know, in each one of those was a painful moment that we, you know, that we went through, but preparing everyone for it and telling them there's this bridge to the other side you know, was was a key a key piece to that, right? And then I think the same thing for the city. You know, the the city was at at a, at a feeling in such a sense of desperation. Um, and I think you know, Governor Cuomo did a great job with his uh, daily uh, press conferences. And I think you know, from a business standpoint, I tried to be a voice 
of, uh, of, of, of advocacy for where the city is going and strength of where we've been before and resilience that we'll get through this again, but also realism that this is, we're not just going to close our eyes and it's going to go away. We all have to work at first flattening the curve and then, uh, then you know, getting through this new abnormal period and then rebuilding on the other side. Uh, and it's, it's going to require leadership to do this. And I think that, uh, you know, so that it, to me, it's almost, again, part of that same civic duty and responsibility that, uh, that you mentioned. And then the one that I'll just say is as, as a, a piece that I did that was really helpful was right in March, I began a, a strategic plan that I called the March to Memorial Day. And I pretty much said in March, guys, we're probably not going to be back in the office and there's not going to be any sense of clarity to Memorial Day. But here's what we need to do between now and Memorial Day. We need to you know, recalibrate everything we thought was reality before and say, okay, what is it in a post-COVID world? We got to focus on helping our communities recover because they're all going through a lot of pain and there's challenges for small businesses, non-for-profits, the municipalities. How do we do that? And then we got to be prepared to rebound on the other side. And I created uh, 15 different working groups with subgroups to focus on each of those initiatives so that they were, each of them were fully dedicated to recalibration, recovery, and rebound. And uh, it, it was really, created really intense, but a really well synchronized, uh, you know, team effort. And people, frankly, who never had even really worked together throughout our organization found themselves working in these subgroups, building bonds and respect that they never had before. And we got to Memorial Day and that's where we actually you know, innovated the whole Microsoft program. And we started to launch that in, in our buildings. Of course, Memorial Day came and we weren't done. So I went to the leap to Labor Day and now we're in the dash to December. And shortly I'm going to, you know, have the sprint to spring. But, you know, but the point is that it, it, it created a mission for people. Right. And I think that mission and alignment of what we need to accomplish in a short period of time was uh, was critical to give people a sense of purpose every day and the sense of accomplishment in dark days. I think that's essential, giving people an idea where they're going with, you know, a marathon's a long run, but you know how far it is. Right. That's exactly. one of the key things people need. Chris. Yeah, no, it's such a good takeaway. Um, just great leaders consistently, especially in times of crisis when everyone's confused, will just start picking, uh, establishing the next, the next goal line, right? And you, did, you got there and it wasn't like you thought it would be. Now it's the drive to December right. and the sprint to spring. I mean, that's just a great way to frame it. Um, a final question for me, Scott, um, and something Stan and I believe in deeply is the idea of, of mentorship. And we'll often tell folks we work with or students that we, we, we talk with that it's it's not a nice to have, it's your responsibility yep. as a leader. And I would assume, I mean, you are a, you know, you, you've had a great career and will continue to do so in, in a real estate business in the real estate city of the world. Uh, so you must get uh, pinged all the time for mentorship for folks coming up in your field. So I'd be curious how you manage that and how were you mentored earlier in your career to get to where you, to where you are today? Um, so the uh, good questions. And actually, my call right after this is to mentor someone that had just reached out to me who, you know, a team at a public, uh, the speech I gave it asked for some guidance to get through this. Right. So you pick your spots. And like I'm sure you both, too, is you wish you could have more hours in the day to mentor everyone that comes. But you got to try to be selective, which is one reason why I try to also um, speak at a lot of um, events where there are young people. Right. I try to really focus on. Um, where there are the you know the young people who are starting their career, where I can then share my insights more broadly with people. And for them, by the way, right now, what I, the message is: this is the if you were going to start a career, this is one of the best times to do it because you're in a a, a you know once in a generation moment with the way people operated and lived and worked. Yesterday is going to be different than tomorrow, and because you're coming new to the game, you're new to this situation. You're bringing a perspective that's not clouded by our perspective of having the last number of decades operating in a different way. And, and so that is a, a, you know, I think an advantage for young people and one that I, I push for me, I came into the business in the late eighties, which was another re recessionary period. And particularly for real estate where everything that um, my family's business had operated in the past was turned upside down. It was a local business with local relationships. Uh, you had the local farmer, the local lender, you know, and the local development construction guy. 
And then it all became about institutional, right? And it became about uh, you're dealing with, you know, securitization, stock market, bonds. And I led my family business through that transformation uh, and took our company public at that time in, in 1995 and then ended up, we sold it in 2007 and then started RxR. But the, the, the point was it was a window where you had a chance to, to define what that future looked like versus try to find a place to settle in to how things were progressing. And so if it, so for me, what was interesting also is I was always surprised uh, and then learned to, to just continually do it. When I pick up the phone and I would call someone that I didn't know and say, you know, mind if I pick your brain about something, let me tell you what I'm working on. And they would spend the time with me. And I made a point uh, when I was young to try to meet with all of the New York real estate legends who were older in their 70s and 80s uh, because I knew they weren't going to be here forever. So I went through a process of having lunch with each of them to try to you know, understand what they went through. Right. And then so it's and so I think the uh, the big lesson that I learned is, you know, if you ask, most people will actually uh, be more than willing to share perspectives with you. How long, how much, I guess, is all depends. But that gave me a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of lessons through life. And then I would my finally on just mentors is you know, having multiple mentors, you know, I have a, a, a Rolodex of mentors that I turn to for different things at different times. I have, a, you know, a guy who is down south and he was, you know, in, in the, in the uh, 82nd Airborne. And he was on my board was a public company. And, you know, he's a guy I turn to when I need advice organizationally. He, he reads my, you know, papers that I write and gives me, I know I'm going to get candid feedback with a good little southern twang that's going to get the point across to me. In a, in a you know a way that plays through. So I have people like that. I have financial people, and and so that's I think important is to is to not think it's not one mentor. It's it's how many different areas that you can are going to be focusing on and try to find mentors that fill those spots. Wow, yeah, those are great examples. I, we always in the Navy we would tell young officers when you start working with the Army, be be very cautious of this general with a southern <laughs> accent who said who opened by saying i'm probably not the smartest right, exactly. guy in the room that's it <laughs> He's about to eat, eat lunch <laughs> that's true scott let me summarize something as a way of thanking you first we've talked a little bit about real estate in new york we've talked about the future in new york you've talked about social responsibility of private citizens you've talked about the role of business leaders you've talked about the importance of mentoring i mean you've really given us sort of a an overview on what an individual can and and probably has a responsibility to at least try to do. So that's a gift you've given to everybody who's going to listen to this podcast, as well as what you, you do contributing to the community all the time. But you also have given something to Chris and I. You've given us your time, you've given us your friendship, and you've given us your candor. So I want to thank you uh, from the bottom of our heart for taking the time with us and, and for all the engagement we've had. And I look forward to the future as well. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. I thank you guys for, again, for being there for me during the, the challenging times and the lessons that uh, that you were able to uh, to share because they really, really were helpful. So thank you both. Perfect. Now, sprint to spring, slide to summer. <laughs> I may need that one. <laughs> I'm hoping that I can pivot after sprint to spring. <laughs> there you go. Take care, Scott. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks. Really hope you enjoyed that discussion with Scott. Uh, as I said, just a really forward-looking leader. He's immersed himself uh, in the real estate world for you know, decades. Uh, and now is just really well positioned to have a discussion about what that future is going to look like. I know I learned a ton from that. I uh, hope you did as well. Stan and I look forward to having you here next time at No Turning Back. <laughs>